between uh, lower class and class and aristocrat. And the problem is mainly about a alienation of modern world. So hardly really about uh, any city. And um, the connection. I'm sorry, I'm not very good with this. About hardly, I, I don't have any friend of Indian at all. Something. <laughs> so I think it is to, if it uh, to be concerned about uh, uh, with the. Uh, uh, South, uh, South Asia it should be more uh, Malay, that's all, Muslim, which is in Bangkok, it's not, no, not, no, no ethnic city problem like that. Actually, if you know what happened in Thailand now, you know, it's more a problem with class, with, between aristocrat and middle class and the lower class. That, uh, okay, I, I, I'll go to politics later. Sure, sure, I'll come back to the disturbed politics. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think the, the organizers would have wanted to push the envelope, so I don't think you're miscast, e even if uh, Thailand may not conventionally be a part of uh, uh, what we consider South Asia. If I was to move uh, closer to conventional South Asia setting, uh, we know India and Bhutan are very close. Uh, Delhi and Thimphu have excellent relations. But for the lived, everyday experience of many people in Bhutan, I mean, th th there's also an open border. And so it is across the open border that a lot of interactions happen between communities. Uh, would you like to talk about that and how uh, the Bhutan-India relationship is also defined in terms of everyday lived experiences of people crossing the border, being a part of this larger? I'd like to... Uh, thank you, Prashant. I would like to start my conversation with a confession. When the JLF director emailed me the subject of today's dis discussion, I thought Namita Gokhale had made a mistake. So immediately I sent her an email and saying maybe, uh, in, in very subtly indicating that she could have made a mistake. Her email response was prompt, and she said uh, that she hadn't made any such mistake. So left with no choice, curious, I googled, and in less, in less than zero, in, in 0 0.22 seconds, 1.3 billion uh, results appeared on the screen. Interestingly, nothing on East of South Asia, the topic of our discussion today. So this is a very new subject for all of us here. And for long, we have assumed that a country belongs either to Southeast Asia or Asia. But East of South Asia is exceedingly different. Diverse ethnicity, different backgrounds, different religion. There is a also, we share a lot of things in, in common. Uh, East of South Asia has been the cradle of Vajrayana, Buddhism, and Tantarism. Now, to give you a short example, a historical anecdote, you know, in the Nalanda University in Bihar in India, 8th century, one of the oldest, they lived an eminent scholar and a highly distinguished teacher. His name was Sarha. And, uh, like most scholars and teachers, he was obsessed with himself. One day, he leaves the university, goes out for a walk. He, come, he comes across a young girl, a beautiful girl, and the girl charms him. And she, he, Sarah, Professor Sarah finds that uh, she's illiterate, and also she turns out to be a prostitute. He, he's infatuated with her, he visits her, and after one such session, you know what I'm talking about, uh, you know, she tells him on his face, says, you know, Professor, do you understand the word you're talking or are you just speaking for the sake of it? This uh, starts a, a, a spiritual, ferments a spiritual crisis in, the prof in this, in this uh, eminent professor. He moves out of the college, marries her, uh, friends, he comes intellectuals who he considered close and dear friends look down on him. He starts a new profession. He becomes an aerosmith. And uh, one day, he tells his wife, can you cook me a rajesh curry? She said, why not? And before she finishes cooking the rajesh curry, the g Professor Sarah goes into retreat. Nine years later, he breaks his retreat. And the first question he asks his wife is, have you finished cooking this uh, rajesh curry? And the lady looks at him and says, after nine years of spiritual contemplation, if this is all, you, if the Rajesh Kari is all you can think of, you know, you wasted your time. And he goes right back into re retreat. 
Fast forward 700 years, in the 15th century, there's a Tibetan yogi wandering, wandering around the Himalayas, comes to Bhutan, lives there, uh, and his name is Lam Lama Drukpa Kile, and popularly known as the divine madman. He's the kind of person, he's a womanizer, drink, drank like a fish, and the kind of person you would not introduce to your daughter, or your sister, or for that matter, even your mother. And today, in Bhutan, this wandering uh, yogin, uh, very unconventional in his thought and action, studied the most, very, his teachings are very popular, and he claims to be the reincarnation of Sahara, the Indian, uh, uh, Indian scholar from Nalanda University. So east of South Asia, you know, it's complex. You know, we think differently, we do things differently. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, th thank you, Sharing. I think that was useful just in terms of looking at the historical and cultural connections uh, that do exist, but there is, of course, the diversity that, uh, that you mentioned. Uh, the culture is something that interests you as well, Somi. Uh, do you think it is through cultural connections that one can conceive this, sub this region, East of South Asia? Uh, thank you, Prashant, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I was really uh, thrilled when I heard this topic. I don't know whose idea it was. It's probably yours, Prashant. I, I see. I look at you accusatorily and I say, no, it was it. yours. <laughs> don't but give me credit or don't leave me. A, it was a really uh, delightful uh, thing to receive East South Asia, because it's new, as Tashi was saying. Um, because naming nomenclature is extremely powerful. Naming has mythic, magical power. Um, I'm sure many of us remember the story of Rumpelstiltskin, who hid his name. And once his name was discovered, his power was gone. So we've had mythic um, connotations and values and importance and magical values given to naming. So when you name a new area, in a time when academically and intellectually area studies is a somewhat going out of fashion, and then you come up with a name like East South Asia, it is really intriguing. I actually tried not to think about it because I really wanted to think on the spot with you in your presence, Pradyot and so on. Um, and because we, have, we are called very many different names by different people in our lives. We, we can, someone's called you daddy, someone calls you son, someone calls you husband, someone calls you by your name, someone calls you professor. It depends on where the things are coming from. In the Northeast, we call ourselves Maitais. You guys call us Manipuris. Both are accepted. One is an exonym, one is an antonym. We are called Northeasterners. Sometimes we are called Pahari. Derogatorily, we are called Jinkies. All fine. Depends where they are. The collection of names, I think, is an important thing. And when you say East South Asia, you've named us. And it's a delightful name. It's really interesting to have to explore this. Because this actually comes into the realm of something that I've been very interested in as a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a curator back in New York where I've had most of my career. And I, ha I have been calling it remapping. Actually, a friend of mine called it remapping. She said, what are you doing? You're taking Appalachian filmmakers to mountain regions in Yunnan and Sichuan. You're remapping the world. And I said, yeah, I like that. Because after all, you have a political map, you have a physical map, you can have a map of population densities, you can have a map of crops, you can have a map of GDP, anything. These are ways of approaching a reality that will never be captured by any single map. So when we remap and call this region, or what is this, is there a region? Maybe the question is East South Asia, question mark. Maybe that's the title of the of the, of the panel. So what I do see is that we are looking at the idea, a reformulation of the idea of the periphery, of the center, and South Asia as that block of land that is still ramming itself under the Pangaea, still buckling the Himalayas up, is still, it has the peripheral regions that here we all represent except for Sri Tong, which is, which is the interesting uh, dark horse in this panel here. 
because we've had in the recent few years an immense amount of political importance given to this notion. It may be stated differently, but the entire concept of the trilateral highway, for instance, being shared by India, but, uh, Myanmar, and Thailand, is very central to India's foreign policy now. And it's not just a BJP thing. Maybe he is um, prioritizing it and putting it on the fast track because this is a man who likes to take action. Okay, fine. So he's been in power how long? Five months, six months? But this idea has been going on for a long time, even in all administrations. So when we have the region opening up, Impal, the capital of Manipur where I live, now has an international airport. There are chartered flights coming in from Mandalay. They're opening up a visa office, passport office, customs. How do you do that in the middle of, of an insurgency and armed separatism in that neighborhood, not just from the Indian side, but also from the Burmese side? So, and as a uh, traditionally closed off region, perhaps even as closed off as North Korea is today, is suddenly being opened up. We have a friend of mine is opening a Marriott right now in, in Impal, looking for land. He has, he has the franchise. So how to an insular region, a remote region, an isolated region with very few communications. I mean, roads have to travel from Calcutta. You just can't even drive across Bangladesh. You have to go all the way up to Siliguri and come all the way down to reach Tripura. How long is that? There must be a what? Another 500 miles addition added to that journey? So, so now this region is opening up, then what? What do we say? What do people of the region say to people who are coming to visit us now? I have friends Jean-Louis and Denis that I just met uh, after many years from Paris. They want to visit me. They could not, they were telling me a few years ago, they were not allowed, allowed to go into Manipur because they were not a party of four. That was a law. You were given three days. Now you people can just wander in with a backpack. What does that mean? How do we then as cultural people represent ourselves? What do we show Jean-Louis and Denny when they come from Paris to visit me in Manipur? What do I show them? What is it about Manipur that I think about myself? What is it about the Northeast? What does it mean to be a, an ethnic minority in a country that only recognizes linguistic and religious minorities? These are all questions that arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumi. I think that, that really set, has set the stage for us to uh, take these ideas forward. Uh, the idea of remapping uh, means that we are willing to challenge the existing state-centric discourse. At the same time, the state itself is changing, uh, and the state itself is facilitating certain contacts that it was not uh, doing earlier. And I think that's a, that's, that's a point where I, where I would like to get you, Pradyut. Pradyut wears many hats. He edits the Northeast today. He's also the president of the Congress party in Tripura. The Congress uh, began this policy of uh, Look East. Uh, the BJP has developed it, and now they even formulate it as Act East. Uh, the entire conception in Indian foreign policy of looking east uh, has northeast. Uh, the northeast would play a very important role in, uh, in if, if that policy is to uh, get operationalized. How, how do you think that will open up, and that is opening up over the past 20 years since this policy was formulated, opening up possibilities to think about this region differently and deepen connect and is deepening connectivity in the way so we talked about. Well, I have to answer this in uh, not in one. Uh, there's no single singular answer for this. But let me try to be as honest as possible since you've announced that I'm a politician, they'll already be doubting that I'll be probably lying a lot. <laughs> the, 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 fact, the fact is, uh, what our friend from Bhutan, what our friend from uh, Thailand, what uh, Swami Roy from Manipur has said is correct. But uh, I have a basic problem when we say east of southeast. That means, uh, the whole of India is southeast and everything beyond that is east. I think that itself is a wrong argument. I don't think that we should term any region as a monolithical area. Uh, we don't say, oh, that is South India or that is North India. I'm going to North India. But when I do come and people ask me, like I took a flight from Tripura and I reached, it took me eight hours. It takes me 45 minutes to reach uh, Thailand. It takes me 15 minutes to reach Bhutan took me almost eight hours to reach uh, Jaipur. And then people ask me, Acha bhai, you are from Northeast. 
There is no such thing as Northeast. There are eight different states, different languages, different communities, and we have a different culture, which is yet Indian, as much Indian, if you wear a Panek, or if you wear a Rignai, or if you wear a Sari, or you wear a Jain Slam, you are still an Indian. But the last three words which I've mentioned to you are, are uh, wear at an uh, attire, but to a lot of us, they wouldn't know. Now the question is, why don't people know about Northeast or let's say Manipur, Tripura, Meghalaya, Assam, Arunachal, Sikkim, Mizoram, Nagaland? Why? Largely because I think we are inherently wrong and uh, I will not take pot shots at any political party. But when I was growing up and I studied in ICSE, which is uh, the national board, and all I knew or all I read about Northeast was that in Kaziranga you get a one-horned rhinoceros and Cherapunji is the wettest place in the world. <laughs> That's it. But I knew about the Rashtraputas, the Pratiharas, I knew the non-aligned movement and how Tito was, uh, you know, Nasser, we knew everything. But about your own country, there was so less information. Now I can understand if the generation preceding us did not know enough about Northeast. But now, I also feel a growing sense of, uh, I see it, I sense it. When, uh, when Swami walked into his hotel in uh, Jaipur two days ago, he's from Manipur, and he gave his passport as identification. It's an Indian passport. The lady in this hotel, or the gentleman in the front desk said, where is your visa? <laughs> now, he was being, this is not race, racial, he was being ignorant. We understand. We also know why we should not overreact. But this comes because there is a general con concept of India being in a certain way. I also feel the same when I see, and I see so many foreigners here. And, you know, when we speak about, you know, Swami, I'm, since we're all from the East, and Prashant is from Nepal, which we consider the Himalayans, so many foreigners come here, and they would generally tell me, I said, why don't you come to Shillong? come to Tripura, come to Manipur. And they would say, oh no, we want to go to Agra. <laughs> you know, the temples in Khajurao. Fine, I mean, that is the India they want. But the truth is, I think the first step of East of South Asia or South of North Asia, whatever we want to say it, the first step is that we have, as Indians, you know, there's someone from Jaipur who wants to come. He should be made welcome by us. And if someone from Tripura or Meghalaya or Arunachal want to come to Jaipur, they should be made to feel as welcome. I think that's the first step of identifying your country. I, I, I... And till the time, and till the time we don't, we, till the time we don't address the basic national matter, which is within India, we can talk about Bhutan, we can talk about Myanmar, we can talk about Thailand, we can go as far as Lagos and Cambodia, nothing will happen. Northeast has to be dealt with in India and not from a prism of a foreign policy. Today, we are looking at it as a strategic part of India. It should be dealt as an integral part of India. That's, that's very moving. Um, can I ask you a follow-up on that? You think, and you know, over the decades, the alienation in the Northeast, or the, the different states which constitute the Northeast, has the alienation deepened or has integration with the with what is called quote unquote the mainland in India has that deepened? Which strand has become more powerful today? No, I, I, I would say that uh, you have to you have to give credit to the media when there has been reported cases like when Nido Tanya was uh, or we all know about Iram Sharmila's struggle against Armed Forces Special Powers Act. This if she had gone on a uh, or somebody had gone on a hunger strike in the 60s or 70s wouldn't have been reported. So I think yes. Uh, more and more uh, people, are, look at the youngsters who are here, they, more and more people are concerned about Northeast, are definitely more, a lot wiser. But how much has the state played the role in uh, making sure that the Northeast becomes closer to the mainland India? I'm not that very sure, because I think we need to start it with school books in the national curriculum. I think just creating a ministry called donor itself is facetious because you don't have ministry for South India or ministry for North India. You have eight states, there is a federal structure in place, all governments, and I'm not here as a, 
uh, representative of the Congress party, I'm here as a Northeaster. I'm here as a Tripuri. And I want to say that it upsets me highly when I go to uh, South Block and the minister or the bureaucrat looks at me and identifies me not from my state or my community, but from my region. I think that is wrong. And you should, we should do more. And yes, the gap has lessened, but I think more has to be done. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when somebody came and met me a couple of days ago, and this young chap, you know, he came and said, dude, I know so less about Northeast. That's the standard line. I said, you have Wikipedia now. <laughs> right? So there, I mean, if you know which tree Lindsay Lohan rammed her car into in Beverly Hills, and you know where Area 51 is, where UFOs apparently landed, then you might as well know something about your own country. It's there on the net. The younger generation, if they want to know about Northeast, there is a lot more they can learn than the generation preceding us. And yes, that has helped. Of course, there will be a few ignorant people. You cannot wait for ignorant people to wisen up to connect Northeast with the rest of India. Thank you. Uh, because we're talking about the knowledge deficit that exists within India about the Northeast. But there is so much knowledge deficit within India. We, I think India has become so insular, the Delhi media, the Delhi intelligence here, that we don't know what is happening in Thailand. And Thailand is going through such political convulsions over the last decade. Uh, you've had street struggles, you have an authoritarian kind of regime right now. Could you tell us about uh, the political struggle there and how it is shaping your writing? Because your writing, I understand, in the Thai language is very political. So like uh, my former panelist said, you know, it, it, it seemed that they control narrative, is it? Um, you know, we, we, we kind of like talk about tradition and stuff, about culture, history, and language. So I have some, like, it's why we have two notes about this thing. I think it's a, in, in Thailand, uh, we, we, we are so, con uh, tradition thing is very a main thing. It's like hegemony of things. Like, and you know, and we know that uh, progress, uh, tradition is necessary for progress, you know. And um, um, progress is uh, based on, or building on uh, what we have, what we achieve. But uh, um, the problem is about uh, the tradition in Thailand is that we, um, it's, it's a solid mass. It, it controls narrative. It, we, we have a lot of law to, um, we, we, I mean, in the coup, we, we, they try to rewrite the textbook, put garbage in the, the next generation head. Anyway, so, um, so it seems that the, the tradition in Thailand, so and uh, the narrative that being controlled is, is no room for criticism. You know, uh, I mean, tradition is some, some is, is it showing the attempt of many many generations that did a, a lot of a failure, success, and you know which direction we should go is this generation and generation is is kind of like a collective of thought of failure and success, and we need this to to you know to make a progress in, in any society. Okay, so we need to criticize. We should let the, uh, the tradition should be malleable, should be, uh, can be criticized, can be shared, can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, can make a dialogue about it. Yeah. Uh, come to the second point. So you know about Thailand, uh, since like last decade, we have a lot of uh, political turmoil. And uh, finally, after two coup in about to coup the tap in uh, about one, one decade. Uh, last year, we have a, a real thing, a cool, real thing. It, it's not as bad as like authoritarian state like in 1984. It's, you know, it's, but it's authoritarian state that everybody have, okay, freedom to, to choose. You can choose between Indian curry or Chinese noodle. You can do, a, you can do a ab abortion or choose your own, or your own gender, your sexual maturity, but you don't have a, you don't have a, a choice to regulate your future. You don't have a voice in public sphere. You don't have, a, a, you know, control your destiny. That 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 not a real uh, not a real uh, freedom. It's just a personal freedom. So, as a writer, I mean, um, what what is lead to this outcome of this tradition? Actually. Okay, I try to find out to connect between the coup and the tradition. It's because the, the coup is not just 
one, uh, one group of military people uh, doing it. It being, I have to act according to Thai law. I couldn't say some certain thing because it, I can have a problem when I go home. Anyway, the point is that um, it, the coup is uh, embraced by middle class and aristocrats, which is using uh, this tradition of hegemony of, of you know, that the tradition that doesn't believe in human uh, equality, that uh, the lower class sh should have the same voice as the, the aristocrat, you know, and no freedom of speech, no freedom of uh, expression. So it made me think that should I value it, this tradition anymore because this is lead to what happened nowadays. And um, so as a writer, I have a, usually I, I, I before this, before political turmoil in Thailand, I'm just a writer who writes about, you know, alienation in the modern world, something like that, the personal problem. But since this thing happened, I have to, it's have a, some kind of urge of urgency, I have to write about this and investigate about it. You know, like, literature for me now is, is, is not about being nice anymore. It's not about, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's not about be behave yourself. It's, it's about, it's about p pushing a boundary. It's about make a conversation that, uh, that some people doesn't want to make or want to engage. So, you know, um, so my point is that, you know, I, 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 we need, for Thai writer, we need to investigate and find why we are what we are now, why we become authoritarian state. And being, accept the idea of uh, anti-enlightenment, anti-human uh, equal. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are certain things you cannot say because you're Thai, but I can say it. Uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a common thing between the three countries that we represent, Nepal, Bhutan, and Thailand. We all had monarchies, have monarchies. Our monarch was clearly the stupidest of all. He fought with everybody, he trampled on democracy and people got together to oust him. We are now, now a republic. Uh, the Bhutan monarchy took a different route and uh, initiated a process of uh, calibrated, controlled democracy, opened up democratic space, and which is perhaps why the Bhutanese monarchy is still very popular. And the Thai monarch took, took uh, has also taken, uh, the monarchy, has the institution, has taken a route where it is not willing to accommodate the, di the different aspirations that have emerged from the different classes and communities that you spoke about. And uh, how that will play out, and despite the stringent laws right now, whether the institution itself, uh, where there will be increasing questioning of the institution itself will be interesting to watch. But I won't put you in a spot and ask you to answer that. Uh, let me uh, go to uh, sharing. You know, the, the India and Bhutan, we spoke about the close relationship. One of the key tangible uh, things that happened over the past decade and a half, 2003, if I remember, was when your monarch led the Bhutanese army to flush out Indian rebels, and you were a part of that. You were a part of the military operations. Uh, could you tell us a bit about it? Because security is a big theme in uh, this region, and security, that was one instance of security cooperation. Okay, uh, thank you, Prashant. 12 years ago, 2003, Bhutan, uh, we're a small country, population less than a million, and uh, the first question you will ask is, when you talk about military operation, so what is the strength of the Bhutanese army? And uh, we tell, the number is 6,000 soldiers. We don't even have a single helicopter, forget aircraft or artillery. And 12 years ago, we undertook a military undertaking. And if we had failed, today the nation state of Bhutan would not exist. Now the question is, who, are we, who, are we, who did we fight? In, the, uh, in 1995, Indian insurgents, three group of Indian insurgents, the Ulfa, the Bodo, and Kelo, each fighting for independent uh, state and for their own cause, they were not economic migrants. And because Bhutan and India agreed to have uh, maintain a green belt along the border, and al also the fact that Bhutan and India enjoy such good relationship, there was no need for patrolling. So it was easy for the insurgents to creep into Bhutan, they set up vantage points, they set up uh, 30 camps and uh, used Bhutan to tr for training ground to recuperate and also to launch fresh attacks. 
they also knew that the Indian army would not pursue them. So they occupied vantage points, they were battle hardened, and for seven years, the Bhutanese government negotiated with the militants. We told them, we're a landlocked country, resource strapped, you give us two things, two numbers, a bank account number and the amount of money you want, and for every camp you demolish, we will deposit that. After seven years of peaceful negotiation, Bhutan had no choice but to flush out the insurgents. Reason being, they undermined our sovereignty, they threatened our security. And the king said, look, with 6,000 soldiers, we have to use a different tactic. The strategy has to be different. And the operation was both strategically and tactically a very successful operation. We used a combination of guerrilla warfare, established military warfare. But the overall strategy was drawn from Buddhist principles of non-aggression and, re and restraint. The king, the fourth king, led the soldiers on foot in front. You know, I was, the king could, could have easily drafted, but uh, he said he will call on the nation and ask the true sons of the country to step forward. And only six, 600 of us volunteered, and I was one of the officers. As an officer, two things that really shocked me. The first was my instruction from my king. He said, under no circumstances, you're allowed to fire. And then, as an officer with 140 soldiers, young boys, young recruits who were trained just for two months, they could not understand why they would be prevented in firing from in the conflict situation. My greatest challenge as an officer was to prevent these young boys from firing. We undertook the operation. In two days, or oh, before the operation, you know, we were surprised. The second thing that really surprised me was that instead of the army general, you know, the king, who is the commander in chief of the Bhutan, uh, of, of Bhutan, he brought a senior Buddhist monk. And before the operation, you know, the Buddhist monk told us, just like you are a spouse, a sibling, you know, the opposing forces, he was very mindful. He never used the word enemy. He said, a someone to somebody. Buddhism doesn't allow you to kill. And how do you fight a war without killing? In two days, we managed to flush out the, uh, the militants. There are two indicators of a war. One is post-war repercussion, collateral damage. There were none, which means the SMS people forgave us. Our neighbor, SM, the statistics say about 26 million people. And the king's logic was, if you killed one person, an SMS, you make enemies, you know, 100 enemies. And even if we won the war, the SMEs will come and take us, take just all they need to do is march and take over Bhutan. That didn't happen. Two days, December 15th, the operation started, ended December 17th. As a militia officer, I had an AK-47 and a 9mm uh, Glock uh, pistol and didn't have to fire any. And even my soldiers, 140 of them, never fired a, a single gun, a single shot. Thank you. Uh, in the security question, and this is for Shomi Pradyut, uh, the security question brings to the fore the idea of borders. For the region to have closer interaction and connectivity, uh, India's borders with its eastern neighbors have to be more open. Instead, what we see in the region is militarization, which what we see in the region is because of because our cultural, because India's you know, cultural boundaries don't match political boundaries. There are communities who are, which are on both sides, and that leads to concerns in the establishment, and they then climb up, and uh, because groups are operating from across the border, uh, there, there is this push to close borders. How will the idea of deeper regional interaction develop with closed borders in the East? Uh, do you see any possibility of a change in mindset in terms of how we think about borders? See, uh, it's, it's wrong to say that uh, if we open up our borders, economic trade borders, that's basically what you're saying. If we open up our economic trade borders, you'll have large-scale uh, migration. Whether it's Bangladesh or whether it's Myanmar or whether it is Bhutan. Bhutan, of course, we have a treaty where there's a free uh, movement of people. The point is that we indulge in politics most of the time. Now, uh, as I said, we have a problem with Bangladesh, largely because there's a huge uh, economic problem in Bangladesh, and there are a lot of people who have crossed over to Assam, 
who have crossed over to Tripura, who have crossed over to different parts of Northeast as well as West Bengal. The problem does not lie in these uh, free uh, boundaries. The problem lies is that there is poor implementation of the border security force. Everybody knows that a certain amount of money can be given for the BSF to actually allow a person to cross over. So if you are looking at trade routes, specify, identify specific trade routes where there can be free flow of traffic, free flow of economic activity, and nobody will have a problem. Tripura, for that matter, uh, because of our connectivity and Chittagong port, is ready to approach the whole of Southeast Asia. That means uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. The point is that we should look at that specific trade route. Like you have Nathula, which specifically looks at China, India through Sikkim. You don't open up the whole uh, China-India border. So have identified trade zones. Have identified trade zones where business is traded legally. But when you try to stop traditional forms of business, somebody from Meghalaya was always supplying dry fish to Bangladesh for the last 500 years. Suddenly, we became a different country, and then you've had a cross-border fencing. Now, for me, who's growing, uh, let's say, potatoes or chicken or farm produce, I can't sell that same uh, uh, potato to Andhra Pradesh. Or we, we, half our poultry stock comes from uh, Andhra or comes from uh, Mumbai, half our meat produce comes from outside Northeast, which is largely a uh, meat producing uh, country. Half our rice comes from outside, while Burma is just around the corner, which is the largest rice bowl of uh, Asia. So if we allow such trades to take place, costs will come down. There will be more mutual belief and trust, and there will be larger economic activity. It, it, it makes more sense for us to specify that. And we indulge in politics. You know, he said something very important. When the, uh, the, the king himself went at the forefront, uh, we know it because we were in college when we, heard, we read in the newspaper, the king is leading the army to flush out the Alpha and the NDFB and KLO. Now, these are dreaded forces which have massacred Indian armies. But five and a half to 6,000 Bhutanese forces managed to do it without making any one of us feel hostile towards the Bhutanese community. Because most of the NDFB or the Alpha, we were related to them. We had our uncle there or our cousins there or our people from our same community. And there's a huge uh, Bhutanese community staying in Northeast who are working, who are trading. We didn't feel any hostility towards them. We understood their problem. To reduce collateral damage, you need to be very simple, very clear, very direct. And economic, prosper economic prosperity is the only way we are going to integrate India as well as us with neighboring countries. Until we don't have enough economic activity, we will have the same narratives where we will discuss about armed forces killing, poverty, drugs. All this is coming easily. Then why can't we have rice or, uh, or food produce or economic goods coming easily? What is border? stopping it? Is it the paranoia of the security establishment or something? Well, if, the, if the BSF Jawan stops a, a, a hundred bastas of rice coming in from Myanmar, but then allows uh, MDM or uh, spasmo or drugs to come in, you need to ask him that question. Na? That why are you allowing? Because it makes money. You allow, it, the golden triangle is there. If drugs are coming in, if guns are coming in, and then you prevent chicken or you pre prevent rice or you prevent uh, basic uh, 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 human resources, then there is a problem at the border. And the border is not being guarded by you or me or any one of us. It's been guarded by forces who are supposed to guard that. So if you open up these trade routes, these bureaucracy, these, red, uh, these uh, bottlenecks will end. Open activities, open economic activities, identify the areas where economic activities should be stressed upon, and automatically you see mutual trust growing and suspicion going down. Thank you. Uh, so me, you, besides the economy, uh, and this is actually linked to the economy, you were talking to me before the session started about the potential of tourism in bringing the region together. Would you like to elaborate? Thank you. Um, um, yes, it's, it's actually a concern of mine that uh, uh, unregulated tourism is coming into the region. Um, I think people basically just see tourism as the uh, answer to everything, that this is going to produce easy money. They see tourism dollars. Those are dancing in their eyes. What, um, what concerns me is really the impact of tourism. 
Uh, and what model of tourism? Is it going to be tourism like we have in Bhutan, for instance, which is one model, the, or the tourism of Kathmandu, or the tourism of Bangkok, for instance? These are three different uh, kinds of tourism. So what kind of tourism is it going to be when the people have been really isolated for a very long time? And one of the things that concerns me, which relates to what Pradeet was saying early, and we've had this conversation in, in uh, Cambridge in 2012, was the need to tell the stories of the Northeast, that the narratives are important, and that, yes, we are the other right now. We are peripheral. We are the regions surrounding the mainland India. So we, it's not just a matter of race. It's not just a matter of the Himalaya. It's also the, the question of the other, that we, they want to hear from us and how we think about how we connect. So, this kind of um, uh, setup requires that we tell our stories. And we have at the Jaipur Literature Festival a lot of storytellers here, and a lot of people interested in storytelling. And how much do you know about the history of Manipur? How much do you know about the kingdom of Tripura? How much do you know about Nepal? What are the stories? We know, we read about Aurangzeb as we were saying, you know, Indian history, we have, we know world history, but how much of those stories are being told? Part of the story is actually, yes, we don't have people in New Delhi knowing, but unless we tell them, how are they to know? Because the main narratives of India today in the 21st century relate to, say, the ongoing Kashmir issue, Hindu-Muslim relations, IT, the stock exchange, we want, to be, we want to resume our place as the rightful historical place as the, one of the leading cultural and great empires of the world that we used to be. We, so these are the main narratives that are unfolding in India right now that India Inc. is trying to um, package and promote and develop. Where does the Northeast, a region, a border region like this stand in this. Are we going to watch a caravan going by? Or are other people going to participate in this? I had this conversation with businessmen about three years ago, or four years ago, um, and I said to them, I said, you, you businessmen, whether you are Ill doing illegal activity or legitimate activity, it's business. You have to really think about how are you going to make some money out of this, for instance. It's not my, I'm not a businessman, that's not my concern. But we all, ha we all know that trade is happening. We all know that uh, the roads are being built. There's a new National Highway 53 is being built, right, rebuilt right now after 50 years of decrepitude. Um, there's a, there are new rail lines coming up. There's a new railhead. Man Manipur is getting its full railway station for the first time. So is it really just an alley? Is it really just a bridge? Is it really just a channel? Or is this channel, is this bridge also populated? Because in 1962, when we, there was a Sino-Indian War, the soul searching that India did in 1962, after the, in the aftermath of 1962, actually had, I was told by, um, by Sanjeev Barua in, at Bard College, that one proposal, and I joke you not, is that the solution next time would be to populate Northeast India with Punjabis. Seriously. And a few years, three years later, the Indian Armed, the Indian Air Force was bombing one of the state capitals, Aizawl. How many people know that? How many people, how much of that is part of the political history that is being taught in schools right now. How much do we know about Iram Sharmila? Iram Sharmila is no, not just a matter of someone resisting something. I think the case of Iram Sharmila is basically torture. Uh, President, you wanted to say? Since your question was related to tourism, uh, let me say that uh, in 2003, I started the first uh, heritage hotel in Shillong. Uh, the basic problem, since it's a tourism related question, I'll be as direct and specific. Uh, it's very difficult to get a loan in Northeast because there's ambiguity with the land laws. Uh, banks don't give you a loan because uh, 
it's a tribal area, tribal property, so you cannot have it as collateral. So that becomes a big hindrance in loan. I believe that su successive governments from different regimes have tried to ensure that now loans are more available for people to start private entrepreneurship. I think that will help in uh, tourism. Second thing which is really helping in tourism today, and we have to give a positive side of Northeast, come on. Uh, if someone is now in a village, let's give an example, everybody knows Chirapunji. Now, if you landed in Assam, or Guwahati or Shillong, uh, the person from Chirapunji had to come all the way to Guwahati or Assam to work to make some money. Now with the tourism on rise, the person can stay in his village and people visit his village and they make money out of it. So, I th and I think that also breaks a lot of cultural barrier because uh, if someone is coming from uh, Jalandhar or somebody is coming from uh, uh, Trivandrapuram and they're meeting someone, they're being uh, given the local food, they're also being given something which is edible or which is local to the tourists. So I think it does break in, uh, you know, what authorities cannot do, people to people contact do. So tourism is very important. Uh, another way of getting respect from the rest of the country is for people to visit our part. That's why I said about Agra and uh, Kerala. And if people start coming to Northeast and they realize the unseen beauty, I think it will, next time you meet a person from Mizoram or Nagaland or uh, Tripura or any part, Arunachal, you'll have a whole lot more respect because you've been to that place and you say, whoa, that's a great place. So I think tourism really helps beyond just economic activity. Second thing which Swami said, I have to disagree with him here. You know, uh, I think that entire thing that we have to uh, populate uh, Northeast with Punjabis is wrong because after the 1962 war, the 6th, uh, the 9th schedule and the 6th schedule were uh, incorporated which ensured that nobody from the rest of India can actually buy those land and this was actually meant for the local population. So what somebody may have told you is hearsay because the act of parliament itself said that we are going to protect the people of Northeast and we are going to ensure by passing the 6th schedule and the ninth schedule and the Forest Act, people from outside will not be able to buy land. And that's so a that useful clarification. Something, that's something which is politically, which is in the parliament itself. So unless parliament contradicted itself, I don't know. But the act suggests henceforth that this didn't happen. I think that's a useful clarification. On that note, I think we have about 13 minutes. And uh, I, if there are questions from the floor, I'd like to open it up. Uh, sure. The lady in the front. Keep your questions crisp, then you'll have substantive answers. Recently, we have seen the unrest or agitation in Assam by Bodo's tribal people. What would be your say in this respect? that uh, these ag activities and such ag agitations results in uh, uh, or these re activ activities are responsible for northeast that northeast that it is not a part of uh, i mean for uh, for north northeast being so isolated from india though despite of uh, this area has great capacity to attract tourism and etc but uh, don't you think that these activities are only responsible that people don't like to visit there uh, that's my question. Madam, uh, if I may say so. Yes, yeah, Pradeep. I go to Delhi every month. I go to Delhi every month. I go to Delhi every month. If there was a bomb blast in Kashmir, I don't stop going to North India. In the Northeast, in the Assam, which has happened in Boroland, that's why I keep on saying I have a huge problem calling the whole region as one region. There are eight different states. What has happened in Boroland is probably 17 hours away from where I stay. Uh, probably 25 hours away from somebody else's days. So if something happens in, let's say, UP, I don't stop going to Jaipur. The problem is that, yes, and I'm not, I'm going to say that NDFP problem is a huge problem. It's an ethnic problem. But that does not affect what is happening in Sikkim, what is happening in Shillong, what is happening in Agartala, what is happening in Imphal, what is happening in Itanagar. So we have to also be aware that Northeast is not just one zone where if one, uh, something happens in one part, the whole area shuts down. So it's very important for us to also realize that Northeast is a very big area and it is happening in one part of the region. The same way, if there's a bomb blast in Gulmarg, I don't stop coming to New Delhi. So this is very important. I think uh, the gentleman, I'll come back to you, the gentleman there. Sorry, I'll come back. 
if I may offer a consolation to Mr. Somi Roy, there are four distinct South Indian states. They speak related Dravidian languages, but to most North Indians, especially Punjabis, we Punjabis, anything south of the Vindhya Mountains is a Madrasi. Anyone south of the Vindhya is a Madrasi. You have these seven eastern states, and if we say that's, well, foreign country or whatever, perhaps you'll understand. And the second thing is, I had come to this session hoping to hear something like the ethnic and linguistic similarity between the Assamese, the 15 million Shan of Burma, and the Siamese. They're the same people. The tremendous similarity in language, and if you take the North Indian culture of Sanskrit and Pali, you can go right up to Cambodia, the alphabet is the same, and tremendous vocabulary from Sanskrit through Buddhism in these languages. Thank you, sir. We'll treat that as a comment. Uh, can you get the mic here, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, sir, I just wanted to know uh, what is the role of ILPs when we are endorsing the idea of cultural proliferation? So, what do you think about it? When, yeah, when Assam is asking for ILP for others, I mean, for the entire nation, it becomes others now. So, can you please talk about yeah, that? My, my personal view is that ILP should be done away with. My personal view is that inner line permit uh, is a British Act which was, uh, uh, which was uh, pr uh, promulgated in 1873. And uh, anything which restricts the movement of people within the Northeast or from people from outside to Northeast is an impediment. Uh, as long as we're not, uh, if there's a fear of uh, alienation from their own land, then that is still being done with large dams, uh, minings, for dilution of Forest Act, which is happening right now. So I think personally that inner line permit, which prevents an Indian from moving into another, or um, just going around another part of India, should be done away with. That is my personal view, and that is the view of largely almost everyone. Second thing, what Sir mentioned to Swami Royji, uh, my mother tongue is Tibeto Burmese. My mother tongue is Tibeto Burmese. Ha. Uh, so my surname is Dev Barma, so, uh, and, but we speak Khasi, which is also Khmer, which is Cam uh, Cambodian. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities between languages within Northeast, and largely we come from the Sino-Tibetan or the Tibeto-Burmese stock, or from the Mon Khmer stock, which is Austric, which is largely Cambodian. So yes, that is, that's why I was saying that culturally we've always had uh, understanding. It's easier to communicate, not only language, our dress sense, our food, the way uh, we uh, interact, our hospitality is largely very similar. So, and our society, matriarchal, matrilineal society as well. Question from the gentleman in the front row. I'll come back to, I'll come back to you. Thank you. You very rightly raised question about the governmental formation of the Ministry of the Northeast. But as limiting as it is, didn't you find a need for a much more uh, inner regional formation. You look at the Northeast, you blame mainstream India for ignoring. But what is the dynamics of inner cultural interaction between the Assamese and the Manipuris, you know? So the problem of mutual respect and mutual interaction, Northeast is not just an administrative category. The issue of the minorities, that brings me to our friend from Bhutan, as you are fighting against the rebels, what is the position of minorities, for example, Nepalese in Tibet, and with the democratization, is there a transformation of policy towards the minority? That's a good question. Can you... Uh, Shering, would you like to take the minorities question in Nepal first, and then perhaps oh, Pradeep could start, and then you could pass it. Uh, the first keep thing it crisp is, now. Yeah, only I'll keep minutes. it very brief. Uh, I think that the, the role of cultural... Uh, harmony is not only restricted to the government of India, it's also equally important for the state governments to take an equal role, ensuring that we know enough, and as I've suggested, that the NCERT books on uh, studies on Northeast should be in the national curriculum. We have also uh, recommended that the state of Manipur teach something about Tripura, the state of Tripura teach something about Assam, so that 
instead of we should also know mutually more about ourselves. Uh, the second question I think is regarding yeah, the sharing. Him, so I'll hand it over to sharing regarding the Nepalese. Uh, sharing that's I think an important question because I know the refugee question has been a, an impediment in Nepal-Bhutan relations as well. So the question of Nepali speaking minorities in Bhutan and their place. Yeah. Prashant raised this question before we started the session. I said there's not, you know, it's, uh, it's a very complex and uh, to be able to talk about it in a minute or so would be, I think, unfair. So maybe if you have time after the session, we can uh, move. Oh yes, we can discuss. You know. Let's, so let's let, let's do this. Let's not talk about the refugees and what happened in the late 80s yeah. and early 90s. But let's talk about the space, the place of Nepali speakers in Bhutan today. Do you think there is, they have they have place in the power structure? Oh yes, uh, yes. Two th 2008, we introduced democracy, and in a very unconventional fa fashion. You know, the fourth king at the peak of his career, at the age of 53, he one day he ab he announced abdication. And the next day, he abdicated and uh, had written a constitution. And his son, who is now the fifth king, has taken this constitution throughout the country and discussed with everybody, including the Nepalese, who we consider very much part of, integral part of Bhutan. And for example, you know, in my office, my secretary is, a, is Anita Nepal. Her name is Anita Nepal, and she's ethnically of Nepalese origin. You know, she, her parents came as economic migrants, and we don't, there's no discrimination. You know, she handles my accounts, she does most of my correspondence, and if there was discrimination, you know, giving an example, you know, I would not use uh, someone like her to, uh, as uh, some, someone who I trust to do things that matter to me. Uh, have I answered? Sharing. Uh, I think we can have the conversation later now, but, but uh, perhaps about the refugees as well. I'll take one last question from the gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was a student in Delhi last year. I was, uh, we at Delhi University have always been very proud of the number of people who come in from the Northeast and study there. But as we all know, the recent uh, events have left us all scarred. Uh, sir, do you think you were all talking about tourism and economic policies? In my understanding and my reading of the Northeast, I think the, the sister states are ethno-linguistic nations. Do you think they are nations, ethno-linguistic nations, like India is made up of linguistic nations, that's what I think. Do you think uh, tourism and econo policies, uh, economic policies which, uh, which, which are trying to increase trade can really, really make people of India, the mainland India as they say, can they really change the perspective of the Northeast? Can it really happen? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you, s you spoke about the racial discrimination which takes place in Delhi. And I was just having a conversation. I'll slightly go over the topic for a second. Uh, India is the world's largest producer of fair and lovely. <laughs> it says a lot about us. You know, and uh, I, I don't know if my friend is here, but she was uh, in the movie Mericom. She's from Manipur. She was supposed to be given the main lead, but then national uh, uh, market forces said, you have to take Priyanka Chopra and not this lady. I think she would have done a better job. But then if you feel so bad about it, I look at Kamal Hassan and Rajni Kant and I take some solace that even they didn't make it big in Bollywood. So now coming back to your question about uh, economic policies for Northeast. I think tourism is one. It's, you know, I've, I've always had a, uh, a, a fundamental problem, and sir rightly uh, put a question as well. You know, sometimes we announce a package for Northeast, let's say IT park holding up package. Now, 70% of the people are in that area not literate, and you open up an IT park knowledge. Now, I think we should know where our strengths are. I think our strength in Northeast is in tourism, it is in agriculture, it is in culture, it's in hospitality. If you look at most of the hotels, it is the people from Bhutan, from uh, it, this, our area is very good in hospitality. We are naturally very uh, uh, cheerful. We are very good in hospitality sector. So hospitality, tourism, agriculture, and a few other areas which are similar to that should be concentrated upon, yeah. rather than us trying to open up an IT park or a Gutka factory, which came up, a lot of them came up in the mid-90s and late 90s. Rajni Ganda came up in Tripura. I wonder how many people were given jobs. But then, that is the way it happens. But we have to be very clear Before about we that. get into the tricky yeah. territory of talking about, about our sponsors, I'll take one final comment from Sobi. 
I think, um, yeah, the, uh, my, my uh, perspective on this is that um, the developmental approach from New Delhi is very paternalistic. Um, every road in India leads to New Delhi. It is a very Delhi-centric country at this point. And I think that it is important that uh, a, a multi-centered, multi uh, more diverse, more dis dispersed decision-making is um, put in place. The concept of India uh, is something that is challenged by the existence of people in the Northeast. I had a conversation, uh, I made a presentation in the United Nations some years back, and I said that Manipur has a civilization, and that upset an Indi Indian gentleman in the, um, in the diplomatic service uh, over there. And my point was that India, as a civilization, should be large enough to encompass smaller civilizations like Manipur. And that is a good point. Thank you so much. Uh, th I'm sorry for the questions we were not able to take. I don't know at the end of the session whether there is something called East South Asia, but we did manage to pack in politics and foreign policy and sociology and economics. Uh, thank you to the panelists for making this lively. Thank you.